Hello, and welcome to our Determined to Differentiate series. My name is Kristen Adams, and I'm a Staff Development Facilitator at the Carbon Lehigh Intermediate Unit. And today, we're going to be exploring maximizing differentiation. If you have not checked out our previous videos, feel free to click on the other links as well to earn your Act 48 credit. At the end of this video, we will give you the link so that you can fill out the exit ticket and receive your Act 48 credit. To get started today, I want to start how I would start any classroom or session with you if we were live or in person or virtual. I would start with a way to build a team and to get to know each other. So let's take a look at some of our COVID memories. And we're gonna start with this. I never would have imagined. You could start a sentence down like this and ask the students or participants in your room and they can fill that in. I never would have imagined that I would take my kids to an amusement park and that they would have to wear a mask and keep it on. Starting with a question or starting with a question stem is a, a crucial way to get everyone in the room feeling comfortable to participate and that they are a collaborative part of your classroom. Checking in is a great resource that you can use as well that gives you questions already started for you that you can ask your students. What are you grateful for? There's tons of questions on here and feel free to try this website as well. In maximizing differentiation, we're gonna review differentiation strategies and add to your current instructional practices. To get started, we're gonna start with a quote from Albert Einstein. Everybody is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it would live its whole life believing that it's stupid. Our job when we differentiate is to allow students to not only have success, but to go to the level that they're at. And the way that we do that is by starting with our assessment. So let's take a look first and review what differentiation is. When we differentiate, we're tailoring instruction for our students looking at content, what students need to learn or how or she will access the information, process the activities in which students engage to make sense of the material or information, and master it, and the product, the things the students produce, the projects or, or activities in which students apply or extend their learning. We also take into consideration the learning environment, the structure of the classroom, the procedures, the way the classroom looks and feels. So take a look at these statements. As you can see, they are color coordinated, but what you can do to create a pre-assessment for your students is to create a drag and drop in Google Slides. So you would drag the statements and mix them up in order, and then you would have the students put what it is or what it is not. So let's take a look at differentiation. Differentiation is, something a teacher, and we'll drag that here, something a teacher plans prior to the lesson based on assessment evidence of student needs. It is not on the spot necessarily, although on the spot we can make adaptations and accommodations for students, but differentiation is something that is planned based on the information that you received from your students from assessment. It isn't something that is something isn't working and you're just changing it quickly on the fly. That is not true differentiation. Differentiation is the use of flexible approaches to space, time, materials, and grouping. It isn't necessarily a certain set of instructional strategies. There are instructional strategies that work better than others. And a lot of that will have to do with the next one, which is a balance of student choice and teacher choice every year you come into a classroom with different students and maybe even different content. So we need to be able to adapt to that. And it's not just a list of choices for students. It's a combination of using all of that information together. So as we go through these instructional strategies today, I want you to come from the lens of your current teaching position. I want you to consider your students, your classroom and content when we start to think about differentiation. So we're gonna start with a way that allows you to just stop and think and create some processing time. So I want you to think about your classroom and I want you to think, how do you differentiate? 
I'm going to set a timer. So we're gonna to go to classroom screen, and this is a free application that you can use. And we're gonna set the timer for one minute. And I want you to think about your classroom and how you differentiate. So I want you to stop and think, how do you differentiate in your classroom currently? As your processing time winds down, you can see if you use this app, you could the time starts to go to red. And we're going to wrap that up. And this is just one of the tools that are available for you on classroom screen. So I hope you took a minute to really think about how you would differentiate for your class. Creating that wait time and space is a wonderful way to differentiate because our students all process at different times. So please make sure you consider that when you're planning your lessons. Now, when it comes to sharing, we also wanna consider it, our different learning styles and diverse needs in our classroom when we're asking students to share. Maybe you want the students to use the chat. They feel more comfortable putting their thoughts in writing. Maybe you want them to think about it and then share with a partner and have the partner share out. Maybe you want to create a space for students just to write. A quick write is a great tool that you can get students to think. So you would just take any piece of paper or whatever structure is best in your classroom, maybe even a whiteboard, or maybe even a Google slide that you want your students to write down. And you would give them that process time to really think through and write down what's most important or whatever question you post. And then the quick writes they could share out with everyone else. So those are some ways to allow for differentiation in terms of sharing. Let's get started with our pre-assessment. Those are the things that we're doing before the instruction. We're using it to determine what students already know and to also value their previous learning. Our goal is to match the learning objective in our pre-assessment. It's a, to allow students to show their understanding in multiple ways. And also it allows students a brief preview. Some of your students are going to need a little bit to get them started. So I would consider activating background knowledge with some of your students and allow them to set the stage for what you're about to learn before you ask the pre-assessment. Think about your classroom. Do your students need a little preview before they get started with the pre-assessment or can they get in, get started and just start with that? That's up to you and your students. But what we really want to show students is that we value what they already know and we want to know what they don't know so that we can plan our, and make instructional decisions. So as you can see on the right hand side, this is a way to create student ownership. If you post a question and students check their top secret or their answer and they can say, I already knew that, now I know. Some tech tools to get you started. There are a lot of tech tools out there. And here are a few. You could use Kahoot, where you can type in the question that you want to assess and allow students to answer it. You can get instant feedback through Kahoot. You could fill out a blank quiz and have students fill that out through Google Form. You could also use Google polling. So you could select a question and I'm gonna make this a little larger for you and the Google poll, and the Zoom polls, I'm sorry, Zoom poll. And when you poll the students, you would know instantly the answer to that question. You, so we have Kahoot, Zoom poll, Google form. You could also use Zoom annotate. So let's take a look at the next slide for how we would annotate. If you would like your students to annotate, you would click the annotate button and then have them select something such as a stamper and the stamper gives you different choices. So if you have an equation such as the one on the right hand upper right hand corner, 
which equation is equivalent to the following equation. Let's say you wanted to know if your students in that math lesson class know the answer to this to get started. Then you can have them use their stamper and say, yes, I know that. Well, I could solve it with some help or no, I don't know. So each student in the, and this could be anonymous, could use the stamper and put where they are in terms of their learning continuum. That is another way to help get started with the pre-assessment. You could also use a drag and drop box like this. How much do you know about reptiles? Let's say you're talking about reptiles. If a student doesn't know any of them, they could put it in one. I, I really don't know. I know, maybe I know something about it. Three, I, I know a little bit more and can identify some reptiles. And four, I can name them. They can drag and drop their name over there. As you can see, another way you can use this if you're in a virtual setting is I numbered all of the boxes, one, two, three, or four. That talks about how confident that they feel in the material. You could have them type that in the chat as well. So if you're doing this virtually, you could say, how much do you know about whatever topic you're talking about? And they can put, you know, number one, I'm not, I'm not confident at all. Number four, I am. Or like I said before, you could set up a Zoom poll and you could poll and they can click one, two, three, or four. You could change the images to whatever motivates your students as well. And that four corner activity is a great way to gauge where your students are before, and you could use it at the end of the lesson as well. We wanna see and what students know already and we want to get them warmed up and get ready to collaborate. There's a couple things that you can do. You could use a graffiti walk or a gallery walk and allow them to go around the room and have discussions. Let's take a look at a teacher that uses it and hear from her how she uses a gallery walk in her class. Gallery walk is a teaching technique that allows students to walk around the room and all see different areas of the lesson um, and rotate and be able to think about several different ideas and topics. The flowers. The first step of gallery walk is to come up with several either pictures or problems. Set those around the room and then you'll pose a question or an idea to the students and have them rotate among the images and think about them and jot down notes, talk to their peers about what they think. So around the room we have a gallery of seasons. So you'll go to, um, I'll assign you guys to a season. With your group, you'll take your gallery walk and your sensory details paper. We'll take about two minutes at each gallery, each station, and write down any words that, any sensory detail words that you think of. I like Gallery Walk because it provides a chance for the students to move around, get thinking, get their blood moving, get their brains working, and then they get to talk to their peers, hear what their peers have to say too, because they can always learn from each other. The benefits of Gallery Walk to student learning are that they get to see several different pieces of the lesson within a small group setting, but they also get to be exposed to several different ideas and topics. We'll go around and share one word from each table. Um, if you hear a word you like, add it to your table. If you're in a virtual setting, another way that you could use this is you could put them in great breakout groups and allow them to explore the different topics in a small collaborative group and then come back. You could give them the slide deck of all of them and they can share and see each other's ideas at the same time as well. Another way that gets students ready and start to learn and work together is using an anticipation guide. As you can see in this image, you could use a statement and you can have students write if they agree or disagree. As they start to work through the text and material, they can reference this and change their answers. You could use it at the end to see if they change their view as well. When we think about whole group, we want to model the topic for our students and we wanna provide graphic organizers and strategies for our students to use. So think about how you structure a whole group. How are you allowing for students to make meaning? Do you want to give each student in your class their own individual slide deck where they're going to be recording it? Do you want everyone to be working together in a collaborative space? 
Then we want to think about our graphic organizers we're using and the strategies we're using to scaffold. So let's think about differentiating the way students access the actual content. If you are going to be introducing the designing of the first flying machine, maybe you want to consider how the students access that content. Using ReadWorks, which is a free program that you can use, you can find articles not only on individual levels, so this is an eighth grade level, so you can change the level in which your students access this material. Another way you can differentiate is by allowing the students just to listen. As you can see at the top, so as you can see, it will now read for you about the Wright brothers. That's one way the students can either read it, they can listen to it, or you could find a video clip such as this one that talks about the invention of the first flight and allow students to watch it. Think about the students in your classroom. How do they best learn? Which is the best way for them to access the content? Now, everyone has had exposure to the curriculum in the way that they learn best, and they're able to add to that conversation. We can also think about the way that we allow students to take notes. We can differentiate the note-taking process for them as well. For the fill in the blank on the left-hand side, you can see the teacher or the, has asked the students to summarize. The one that's colored in blue is a student that summarized the information, what it would look like if they wrote it in their own notes. The image that has the blanks on it is another way that you can allow students to start to begin to take notes or to find out what's most important by leaving blanks in your notes and or creating a close for your students. The final one underneath is a typed copy of the notes. If you have a student in your classroom, an English language learner or another student that could benefit from seeing the actual text, giving them the notes ahead of time and allowing them to process them and read along what you're talking about is a great way to differentiate. They can then add to the notes as well if needed. Fact checking is a strategy for differentiation that allows for students to take ownership. Not only are they gonna take their own notes, but then you're going to encourage your students to trade notes with someone else and to check to make sure the information they recorded is correct. Walking notes is a way that you can have students explore your concepts. So if you have a slide deck or a presentation, you can take your presentation and break it up and put it throughout the classroom. Then you're going to have your students go on and use the slides. So they're gonna look at the first slide that you have either hanging in your classroom or posted in your Google Classroom, and they're gonna take notes from slide one, and then they're going to ask questions. This walking note sheet from Edutopia is available in this slide deck, and you have access to all of these as well. Doodling is another way to differentiate and allow for different types of learning styles in your classroom. You can allow students to doodle their notes. You can model for them the structure in which you want to doodle. You could put certain images already on the page for doodling. There are many ways that you can encourage students to use their learning style and strengths to make meeting. And that is a way to differentiate. This is a strategy called stop and jot that you can use during at transition points and after the lesson. So on the teacher toolkit, there are lots of resources that you could use. I'm not gonna play this video for you, but I'm gonna show you how on the teacher toolkit, you can download templates for many of their instructional strategies and techniques. This one, Stop and Jot, is the elementary version in a Word and Google Doc. They have a secondary version, and then they have a Spanish version as well. So when you go onto the Teacher Toolkit, which is all free, there are tons of resources, and I highly suggest that you take a look at the templates they have already created for you. Those are great ways to differentiate for your students and allow them different access to the curriculum and guiding questions that will go along with your whole group lessons. When it comes to small group, start to think about some of the ways that you differentiate and allow for students to process the content and produce it in a different way. 
Here's a tic-tac-toe that you could create something similar to this novel tic-tac-toe board. And on this tic-tac-toe board, you can see that the teacher allowed for their students to create different things on the tic-tac-toe board. This teacher allowed all of her different tic-tac-toe boards up there and you can make a copy for yourself. So you want your students to pick three in a row that they feel comfortable with and you can see they're all different and they're all interactive. You could also use a choice board. And the nice thing about the choice board that I have linked here for you is that you can look up what you want your students to be able to do and then look at the choice boards that are available. So are you learning new vocabulary words and you wanna use the Freyer model diagram? It will take you right there and you can copy all of these slide decks that are already created for you and allow students to use their vocabulary that you want them to learn. So you can create your own choice board based off of other choice boards that are available to you. And this one here is just an example of how somebody used the different choices for writing in their current curriculum. So they put a bunch of different options up th out there and then you can select as the learner the option that best fits what you want to do for that day, getting to the end goal of whatever your objective was for that day. When it we comes to assessments, we also want to differentiate the assessments. So we're gonna start by looking at a tool called triangle square circle and how the teacher used this technique. And then I'm gonna show you how you can differentiate the graphic organizer for your students. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. First, on the triangle, I want to know three things that you learned today. Three things that you learned today. Then, on the square, I want you to write one thing that you know and understand about what we discussed today. What do you really honestly say you could, that you know about magnets? What is it that you could possibly even teach somebody else? And then on the circle, I want you to write one thing that you're still unsure of after today's discussion. What is still circling in your head that you don't really know and you need some more help on? Triangle square circle is something that was introduced to me when I did go through the Region 13 cohort program. And that is a tool that we use, again, as an exit ticket at the end of the day. It really does help the students because they're able to share out and understand, hey, that's why somebody else understood that. Oh, now I understand because just because I explain it one way doesn't mean that the students will get it. I like to present things in multiple different forms and this is one way that I can know who I need to help and with what. On the teacher toolkit, all of the graphic organizers are there for you, but let's take a look at how we can differentiate that. And in the slide deck, all of the links are there for you, so feel free to use any of them. So the on level triangle circle square is here for you. As you can see the three points, the triangle are what three important points that you've learned. When it comes to square, what's squared with you or what agrees with your thinking. And then the circle, what is still circling in your head. When it comes to our below level students, there's many things we can do. Instead of maybe three things, maybe you want one. The big lines might be helpful, or maybe they actually take away from the learning and you just want to allow a blank space for your learner for the below level. For the next one, do you agree with? Maybe you want to guide your students a little closer to what you want them to agree with or disagree. Do you agree with the author's point of view? Why or why not? You can differentiate and change that. And the last one is draw an example of what you learned. Maybe your students do best by drawing an image that helps them remember it and solidify it. They could do that there as well. When it comes to our above level students, what we want to start to think is how do we get them to that next level? How do we really allow them to start to teach someone else, ask questions and find answers? So for the triangle, if you had to teach this to another classmate, what are the three most important things you would teach? For the square, what is something that squared or agreed with your thinking? And the circling is where would you go to answer the questions that are circling in your head? And were you able to answer it? We want our students to go off and explore and find the answers on their own. So this is a great way 
to allow our above level students to go out and find answers and then come back and say, well, was I able to find that answer? They can start looking at reliable sources. What was my answer correct? All those things allow for students to get to that next level. There are more organizers here as well, but when you're using a graphic organizer, I want you to start to think from the lens of differentiation. What small tweaks can I make to allow for all my students to be successful? Can I get rid of one of the tasks that I want them to do? Can I add a question or add a way for them to go off on their own and start to explore if they're above level student? Those are ways that you can differentiate from something that you already have and are using. You can add to it by adding a way for students that are above level and below level to access content. Here's an example of how a Jamboard would fit into this. You could use a Jamboard for a triangle circle square, and you can use that by allowing students to all collaborate on one Jamboard. Maybe you just wanna pull out the first question. What are three important points you learned? And you're gonna have students come together and start to type their answers. Maybe you want each student to have their own specific Jamboard and you have a triangle and you just want them to answer what's the most three most important points. When you're thinking about your routines and procedures, maybe every, you have taught it so explicitly and your students know how to use it that anytime they see a triangle, they know you want the three most important things. That's something that can be used in a classroom on a whiteboard. You can put that on a, a sheet of paper. There are so many ways that you could use a technique such as the triangle square circle. We also want to consider the learning environment. And some of these considerations include lighting, sound, alignment and zoning. So think through how, your, how it feels for each of your students to sit in your classroom. Are there ways that you need to adapt and differentiate for their learning styles? Do they learn best if they're in the front of the room versus the back of the room? You want to provide tools, visual clues for students. When we talk about putting a triangle up and students know that that means three important details, that's a great example of how you're creating that, those routines and procedures to fit in place. Maybe you want different signals and for stopping or starting. You could even use something through classroom screen. There are timers and stop signs that you can use as well. Do you wanna allow spots in their classroom for students to cool down? Do they need certain fidgets or do they need a special seating? Those are all things that we consider when we look at the learning environment. We also consider the pairing of our students and we want students to begin to self-monitor. So if we are allowing for brain breaks and different opportunities for students to be able to take a break, understand, you know what, I need a break. I, it's too much screen time for me. There's too many things that I'm trying to solidify in my brain. Helping students start to self-monitor is part of that learning environment and creating that safe and supportive classroom for your students. Some of your students might do best by using an auditory way to process. So you can create directions by allowing students to hear your directions or recording them. Today, I want you to go into the text and I want you to find the three most important details. Once you record that, you can now upload that file directly into your Google Classroom or into your Seesaw account or whatever account that you use and students can hear your voice. Now I want us to go back to that, our processing time. And I want you to think, how will you allow for wait time in your classroom? And when you're considering that, I want you now to have experienced some processing time with us today. And we're gonna go back to the classroom screen. And I'm going to set the timer for one minute. And this is what I would like you to do. I want you to think about your classroom and I want you to think about the strategies that you heard today. And I want you to pick at least one strategy that you would take to your classroom and use with your students. Now I want you to either write it down or just sit and think for a minute, but we're gonna allow for that processing time that we want you to allow for your students in your classroom to experience as well.
as you can see, the timer is going to red. Thank you for taking some time to think about the instructional strategies that you would use in your classroom to differentiate and to think about how you're going to create wait time for your students. Now, here's a fun way that you can use the dice. You can use one, two, or three. You can roll the dice. And as you can see, oh, we have 12. Anyone born in the 12th month of December, that would be a person I could call on if you were here and ask you to share out. So there's a lot of fun tools that you can use. And the dice is one way that you could use by asking students whose birthday, the second month, who's in February, I would like you to share. So just some fun tips. In review, let's take a look at some of the things we want to remember when it comes to differentiation. We want to consider the content, the process, the product, the learning environment. We also want to consider small and whole group. What are we doing to differentiate during small group and allow for students to access content and process the information? And what are we doing in whole group? What graphic organizers or what tools and strategies are we giving our students? And then how are we using those assessments to allow for us to differentiate for future lessons or for our current lessons? Our goal ultimately is to give each student the tools they need to find their inner genius. So in conclusion today, let's take a look at this quote. There is no one right way to create an effectively differentiated classroom. Teachers craft responsive learning places in ways that are a good match for their teaching styles, as well as for their learner learners' needs or styles. So I want to encourage you, there are a lot of activities and ideas, but when you differentiate in your classroom, it has to be a good fit for you and your classroom and the mode that you're teaching, as well as for your students and their needs and learning styles. Thank you for joining us throughout the month of January. We have six sessions that are available to you. Please make sure you fill out the Act 48 credit ticket if you would like to earn your Act 48 credits. These will be available for the next month. So if you would like to earn that and check out any of these videos, I highly suggest you do that soon. And please join us for the month of February. In February, we're gonna be embarking on our literacy love or love literacy journey. And we are going to be exploring six different topics, vocabulary, building backgrounds, scaffolding, reading strategies, analysis, and supporting struggling readers. It's been my pleasure to show you some instructional strategies today as we max, we're maximizing differentiation. So thank you for attending. If there's anything that we can do for you, feel free to reach out to me at the IU. My email is adamc at cliu.org. Thank you and have a great day.